Thank you, Cristiano. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight and to share some lessons learned from our experience of COVID at Cambridge Health Alliance, specific to our language access program. So as you mentioned in the introduction, the theme is healthcare interpreting, positioning to thrive during a pandemic. And we're going to accomplish a couple of things in the conversation tonight. We'll review how COVID has challenged healthcare interpreters nationally. We'll talk about why Cambridge Health Alliance invested in a multimodality staffing model even before the pandemic. We'll share a few lessons learned over these pandemic summer and fall months. And we'll talk about how institutions and interpreters as individuals can position themselves to thrive, not just now, but beyond the pandemic. So Cambridge Health Alliance is a public safety net healthcare institution uh, just outside of Boston. Uh, and like everyone else in the country, we have had COVID hotspots. We have had many, many challenges, both as an institution and also our individual interpreters have been impacted. Uh, speaking in very broad terms, what have we seen in healthcare language access in the country during COVID? Well, in most places, in-person encounters have dropped sharply and there's been an increase in demand for remote interpreting. Many institutions saw drop in interpreter requests correlated to low patient volume. Other institutions found that they weren't ready to seat staff in call centers and they had trouble pivoting to a work from home model. Some healthcare institutions even had to furlough or lay off interpreters. Some experienced PPE shortages and others are still struggling to adopt telehealth platforms and integrate language services. How have interpreters fared during the pandemic? Well, nationally, we know that many freelance and per diem interpreters abruptly lost work. Meanwhile, hospital-based staff interpreters, those who retained their positions, they struggled to adapt uh, to wearing PPE, uh, to interpret for folks who are wearing PPE, uh, to interpret via remote modalities for many healthcare interpreters. They had never done video interpreting prior to the pandemic. Uh, some were adapting to work from home. It's been a wonderful experience for some interpreters and a real challenge for others. Uh, and everyone is adapting to televisit platforms that introduce new software and sometimes new hardware to the interpreter's role and certainly new dynamics for patients, providers, and interpreters. Uh, in a recent survey, 40% of interpreters said they had lost household income, even if they had retained their own positions. And many found themselves in this position of having to homeschool children while interpreting from home. Uh, others got sick from COVID, many in the community and some in hospitals. So truly, truly an unprecedented challenging time. So what about Cambridge Health Alliance? Who are we? What did we do leading up to the pandemic and how have we fared throughout the pandemic? So we have two hospitals, each with 24 hour emergency services, 12 primary care practices, 13 health centers and an urgent care facility operating under the same license. We also run the Cambridge Public Health Department. We're not a large organization. We have about 140,000 patients. What makes us unique is that 43% of those patients are limited English proficient and receive care in a non-English language. 43% uh, is a very high percent, even for a state as diverse as Massachusetts. Um, there are only two other institutions in the state that have a similarly high percentage of LEP patients. Uh, and that would be Boston Medical Center, which is the other public safety, well, safety net organization in the Boston area uh, in East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. In terms of our language access program, we have 100 medical interpreters, which makes us one of the larger programs in the state. And we have always provided language assistance across multiple modalities. Um, in addition to our 100 medical interpreters, we have about 200 providers who have been assessed for language proficiency, meaning that we deem them qualified to provide direct care in a non-English language, and some of them have been assessed for multiple non-English languages. So it's a beautiful thing in a public safety net institution that there are 300 plus individuals that can help patients make the most of their care experience in a variety of languages. Uh, in a typical year, this is um, a pre-pandemic year, uh, we were serving about 365,000 interpretations a year uh, in over 72 languages. 
Uh, another thing that makes us unique as a healthcare system is we were the first one, uh, the first hospital in New England to establish a hospital-based interpreter call center seating staff interpreters. At the time, it was to do phone interpreting, and that was in 2008. We introduced video in 2012. So these photos that you see on screen are some of our beautiful interpreters. These are pre-pandemic photos, what it looked like to interpret in person, what it looked like to interpret by video uh, or even by phone as a staff interpreter at Cambridge Health Alliance. We've pioneered many things over the decades. Uh, we have a beautiful origin story. Uh, we started our language access program in 1978. Uh, incidentally, that was the year that MGH and BMC and Beth Israel also got started. Uh, and the origin story is that it was a social worker, Zarita Araujo, a uh, Portuguese speaker who was seeing patients who spoke Portuguese, but also realized there were quite a few patients who spoke Spanish. And she marched down to city hall with two dictionaries in hand one Portuguese and one Spanish, to prove to the mayor and the city council that these are not the same language, these are different languages. And therefore she needed funding uh, to be able to start an interpreter program and hire different interpreters for each language group. Uh, they gave her that funding. And they say, if you build it, they will come. 40 years later, later we have a very large and very robust program. Um, other things that CHA has pioneered over the decades, uh, we've pioneered cultural linguistic education, uh, being the first hospital to hire a full-time educator in 2001. Uh, we got funding from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association to test new technologies in medical interpreting. And that included a video interpreting pilot. And if you look to the right, you can see what video interpreting looked like in 2003. <laughs> the, the, the hardware was certainly a lot clunkier than what we have now, but we were pioneering it. And why were we looking at video interpreting? Why were we looking at cost-effective ways to provide language services as far back as the early 2000s? It's because in almost every year, we have seen an increase, not only in the number of unique patients, but also in the interpreter request volume. And we visualized, even back in the early 2000s, a time when it would become very difficult to provide in-person interpreter services to every patient in every language, if not impossible. So we experimented with different technologies, even while growing our language program and adding staff. By 2008, we were the largest hospital-based interpreter program in Massachusetts. But the downside is that we um, had an operating cost of 6.8 million, which also made us the most expensive hospital-based interpreter program in Massachusetts. And we certainly weren't the hospital with the, the most resources. Uh, at that time, 86% of direct costs were salary, benefits and purchase services, which means vendor minutes uh, in in-person or, or phone interpreting. And so we said, okay, we, uh, there has to be a point at which we turn around our financial situation while continuing to grow our department. We don't wanna downsize, we wanna add staff, we wanna invest in our staff, but we also wanna make them productive. We wanna get the most from their time and their talents uh, because we really did believe at all points in our journey that there's no better interpreter for a CHA patient than a CHA interpreter. There is certainly a value to belonging. There is so much that a staff interpreter can do for patients in terms of navigating them and helping them make the most of their care experience that a vendor interpreter, no matter how linguistically qualified, just can't do because they don't belong to the organization and they may not know what's available to patients within the organization. So we decided to transform the way we provided language services. And in 2008, we established an in-house call center to reduce our phone interpreting vendor expense. And we invited staff interpreters who volunteered uh, to sit down and try this out. Uh, what does it feel like to sit for a full shift uh, and do phone interpreting? And what we found is that the interpreters who tried it out were willing to stay with it. And the providers who had that experience of getting a staff interpreter on the phone, hearing a familiar voice and a familiar name, someone they had worked with in person, they became more likely to use phone interpreting as the modality. Uh, within four years, we were ha handling more than 80% of our major language call volume in-house and routing less than 20% out to partners and vendors. And no hospital had done that before. Usually it's inversed. So in your major Boston hospitals, prior to the pandemic, 
staff interpreters would do maybe 20% of their own interpreting and route out 80%. So we, we had really established something unique, something special, something that had not been seen before in New England. Uh, but we wanted to offer video interpreting. We thought, you know, it's wonderful that we have staff interpreters on the other end of a phone line. It's wonderful that the voices and names are familiar. But what if patients could see the faces? And what if interpreters could see their patients? We had done that pilot in 2003, but we were looking for a way to make it come alive within our department. So we joined um, the Healthcare Interpreter Network, which is a collaborative of hospitals nationwide that share interpreter resources from Massachusetts all the way out to California. Uh, and within one year, we achieved an additional 20% vendor expense reduction. And what our providers told us was that, you know, we love seeing our own faces and seeing our logo behind our interpreters. We also like those other hospital-based interpreters because they're sitting in similar environments. They've had similar training and similar experiences. And it's wonderful to see them too, sitting in front of the logos of their hospitals as well. So the Healthcare Interpreter Network has been a godsend for us. It's been a wonderful way to make video interpreting available pre-pandemic uh, to patients and providers all over Cambridge Health Alliance. They say, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so you can see the, this timeline of modalities at CHA from the fiscal year 2009 through 2017. And you can see at what point we introduced phone interpreting in our internal call center, uh, at what point we introduced video to our internal call center. And you can see the impact of introducing video interpreting on the remote modalities overall. You can see a decline in in-person, an increase in remote, uh, and the increase in video actually pushed the utilization of phone up as well. Uh, since 2017, over 90% of all of our interpreter requests have been served via remote modalities. And that's important because we get about 1,500 requests a day. Uh, so it's, it's, it's amazing the, the volume of interpreting that we're able to handle in-house within our organization uh, through these call centers and through these modalities. What do patients say about it? They rate it pretty highly. Um, when we introduced video in 2012, patients were really open to the idea. I mean, who wasn't Skyping or FaceTiming or doing WhatsApp video with someone somewhere in the world? Uh, for providers, you know, it took some providers a little longer to come around pre-pandemic, uh, but the first group of providers to really embrace the video interpreting were emergency room doctors. Our emergency rooms were our champions because they had a vested interest in patient flow. Uh, under the leadership of Asad Saya, who was our chief emergency uh, physician, currently he's our CEO, and they were trying to achieve a five-minute arrival to triage time, which would make us the fastest EDs in Massachusetts. And they never quite got to five minutes, but by leveraging video, they were able to make the arrival to triage time equal for patients of all languages. Whereas prior to the introduction of video, when providers and patients didn't really want to use phone, 10, 20, 25 minutes would be delayed in the patient care because folks were waiting for the interpreter to become available in person. Uh, so it really was an equalizer in terms of access. And the ED actually did make it to a seven minute arrival to triage time. And papers have been published about this. And the beauty of it is that with video interpreting, it was available across languages. So what did this mean for us when the pandemic hit? We didn't do any of these things because of COVID. We had no idea it would be coming, no one did. Uh, but because we already had these call centers and we already had interpreters equipped and trained to do remote interpreting, we were able to transition 42 interpreters to work from home within 72 hours. And we did this between March 19th and March 21st. Um, to work from home, what we required of the interpreters was to take their Cisco phone home. Cisco phones are video phones, and that's how we were doing our phone and our video interpreting pre-pandemic. Um, they had to take them home to plug them into a broadband internet router. So they needed to have personal broadband internet plan. And they needed a personal computer to be able to enter their data. Um, we surveyed all of our interpreters. Of the 100 interpreters, about 62 are full-time. Uh, and 42 volunteered to go home, 20 volunteered to stay on campus to provide in-person interpreting throughout the pandemic. And we were able to do this so seamlessly that providers didn't even notice until they started seeing interpreters with unfamiliar backgrounds. And asked, where are you? That's so 
looked like your office. And it was actually a home office. Uh, and for some people, a home office was an office. For other people, it was a corner of their bedroom or a corner of their attic or basement. But it was private. It had visual privacy and it had good sound. Um, there was a tremendous coming together in the interpreter team, uh, this solidarity of we're going home to keep each other safe. We're also going home to keep patients safe because as interpreters, the way we move through the organization, we would be perfect vectors for spreading COVID. And pictured on the screen is Sarah Krosky, one of our Spanish interpreters, and she also does needlepoint, she also does poetry. Uh, but this is her depiction of what it looked like for CHA interpreters to flatten the curve uh, by volunteering to interpret from home. So we went home with wonderful optimism. We also thought that the pandemic would only last a few weeks at the most a few months. Um, we really didn't anticipate that eight months later we'd be giving talks like these. Uh, but setting up in advance helped us to transition and pivot to work from home very quickly. So what do we learn in these eight months of working from home? Uh, what I like to call the COVID summer. Uh, we learned four lessons. And the first one is that not all internet is created equal. So how well your video phone works has to do with several factors. And only one of them is, do you have broadband? That was a very simplistic question. And it revealed our lack of understanding of what was really involved. Um, what we would ask today is how much broadband do you have? Uh, because it's partly what internet package you have. Uh, and then it's partly the hardware. Um, have you had an upgrade? Is your router old or is it new? Uh, might you need to replace it before attempting video interpreting? And a lot of interpreters did have to, to either purchase a, a better internet package or upgrade their router or do something else to make video interpreting work from home. And a few did come back to the office because they weren't able or willing to make that investment. Um, the other question we would ask today is who's using it? Uh, some interpreters early on found that when a child was gaming, or another child was doing remote school or a partner or a roommate was working from home, they weren't able to do video calls uninterrupted. Those calls would sometimes drop uh, because the, the internet was being shared across several members of the same household and that was pulling from their bandwidth. Another thing we realized is that some service providers are better than others. Some neighborhoods have better connectivity than others. There's the latency issue. With record numbers of people working from home in April and May and June, there were days when entire neighborhoods would be undergoing internet brownouts or even blackouts uh, and service providers could not keep up. We also realized that some neighborhoods are really impacted by weather. So it would rain a little bit and four interpreters that live in Medford would lose their power. Uh, or there'd be a little bit of wind and three interpreters that live in Everett would go down at the same time. Uh, so we learned a lot about what it means to work from home in terms of internet. A second lesson that we learned over the summer is that staying home doesn't necessarily mean staying safe. Uh, and this is something we could not have predicted. Now we know. Uh, so when you send someone to work from home, but they live in a hotspot, or they're facing some of the challenges that our patients also face. So we think about, okay, what, what are the risk factors uh, living in an urban area, living in a multi-generational home or with multiple roommates, uh, sharing a home with essential workers? Our interpreters face all of these challenges that our patients also face because we hired them from within the same communities where our patients also live. Um, other interpreters had this sense of security. So they sent me home and now I'm safe. And therefore, because I work from home, I'm safe and I can go out at night or I can get together with extended family on the weekends. And not everyone wears masks when they do those kinds of social activities. Uh, and so for multiple reasons, uh, we ended up experiencing four times as many COVID infections in the work from home group as we did in the campus-based group. Our campus-based interpreters actually stayed healthier. Uh, that was a surprise. Uh, and now we understand this a little better that going home doesn't necessarily mean staying safe. There were other work from home related health issues related to ergonomics, um, depression and anxiety, uh, the isolation of working from home, uh, working from home while living alone. Uh, different interpreters had different struggles. Uh, and in, uh, in a few slides, I'll show you what we did to provide better support and more regular support uh, to these individuals and groups that were struggling with different issues.
The third lesson is that the digital divide also impacts our staff. So when we went home in March, we thought, okay, this is nice. People at home, they put their physical homes, they plug them in, most people are up and running, we've placed a few hours, we're good to go. And in April, our organization launched a telehealth platform on Google Meet. And this was really a surprise uh, because Google Meet exists in a cloud and the cloud doesn't integrate with the Cisco system. And so we needed to develop a separate workflow uh, and we needed to use Google Meet as a telehealth platform in addition to our Cisco phones, which were still taking uh, video and phone calls from throughout the organization. So when providers and patients were together, those calls would still come through our Cisco phones. But when providers and patients were meeting on Google Meet and they wanted the interpreter to join as a three-way video encounter, well, then the interpreter had to be able to get on Google Meet. Uh, and what we realized was not every interpreter has a computer at home with a camera and a microphone that would allow them to do three-way video. Uh, and we had to provide some support around that as well. Uh, some interpreters upgraded, some returned to campus because we were able to equip our campus workstations a lot easier than, than the idea of sending equipment out into 40-something into homes. Uh, but this experience of adopting Google Meet as a video telehealth platform was really wonderful. Uh, we're the first health system in the country to integrate Google Meet with Epic and MyChart. And what that means is that the provider from within Epic, the electronic health record, initiates an encounter. And the patient can meet the provider uh, by entering through my chart, which is the personal electronic health record. And they meet in the middle in a Google Meet portal. And we were able to work with the designer, since this had not been done before, uh, to make that portal accessible in four languages. Our top four languages are Portuguese, Spanish, Haitian, Creole, um, and of course, English being the primary. And to give you a sense of how many patients we have, we have about 23,000 patients that get their care in Portuguese, about 13,000 that get their care in Spanish, and about 7,000 that get their care in Haitian, Creole. So we thought, okay, we have to make this portal accessible and navigable in these major languages. And it's been wonderful to work with the IT team and the Epic team and the Google team to make this happen so that patients can enter uh, and consent to treatment uh, and follow the steps into the waiting room in their language uh, and add a support person if they want to in their language. Meanwhile, the provider's adding an interpreter. Beautiful experience. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see Eliani Nani, who is a Portuguese interpreter. She's working out of a basement office. And you see Lara Sharon, who is a social worker who works with pediatric patients in behavioral health. And they've had these amazing experiences about what they're able to do with the Google Meet platform. And this particular moment that Eliani described to me, she said that they were seeing a small boy who had his mom's cell phone and that's how he, he was accessing the Google Meet. And they did scavenger hunt throughout his home. And he took the phone and he ran all over the house and he found the objects and he was so excited and they got so dizzy because of the way that he was managing the camera. But he had so much fun and he really opened up. And they felt through this telehealth platform that they were in his home. And he was in his home. And so he felt more comfortable and was less inhibited. And it was a quality of interaction unlike anything that could ever be achieved in an office environment for behavioral health. And our site providers are, are, have been completely telehealth on the outpatient side uh, since April. And what they say overall is that this has been a really unique opportunity to see how patients live, to meet, for example, a father that never came to the appointments because it was always mom, uh, to meet the other siblings of their pediatric patients, to see a bit of the family's home environment. It, it's weirdly intimate. And a lot of times the families are also seeing the provider's home or home office environment. Uh, but they're connecting with their patients in unprecedented ways and understanding them better through telehealth. And patients are attending their appointments. Uh, no shows are down, attendance is up. And so as more people need behavioral health care, more people have been able to access it through telehealth. And that's really a beautiful thing. And it's been wonderful to participate in the integration of language services around telehealth. The fourth lesson relates to keeping your team close. Um, it's a lot easier to manage an on-site team. It's a lot harder to stay connected with dozens and dozens of people who are now working in their homes in different cities. Um, some are even out of state right now. 
Uh, so we instituted daily huddles from April through July. Uh, we didn't have daily huddles before. Before we had monthly team meetings at each of our four locations where we had interpreters on site. Uh, but we went to daily huddles. And we were doing daily huddles in natural teams so that the on-site interpreters who volunteered to stay at the hospital would feel that daily connection to their colleagues who volunteered to go home. And so that they could talk about their issues. And there was a lot of commonality. And there's also a lot of um, information that was new at the beginning of the pandemic. Hospital policies that were changing, understanding that was deepening. Uh, CHA launched this amazing program to manage COVID patients at home, meaning very few patients had to be hospitalized. Uh, but there's a lot of coordination around keeping in touch with the patients at home. So these daily huddles were informational, they were communal, and they were also uplifting for the interpreters that participated. Uh, the other thing we tried to do was dedicate professional development time so that two times a month throughout the pandemic, we have created dedicated paid time uh, for every interpreter to participate in professional development, online learning, amazing webinars from inside and outside the organization uh, on interpreting for COVID, interpreting for the trauma of interpreting trauma while also experiencing trauma. That's been a hot topic. Self-care building resilience. Uh, some of these have been done within CHA for the CHA community, but most of them are for interpreters and they've been put on by organizations like the National Council on Interpreting and Healthcare, uh, the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters, uh, different interpreter associations, uh, the Healthcare Interpreter Network. And so we're trying to learn something together at least twice a month. Uh, it takes our mind off of the work, but it also helps us continue to grow as interpreters, even from a home office, even during a pandemic. Another thing is that we've been making a lot of referrals to the employee assistance program. Uh, most hospitals and other um, institutions like schools have some kind of EAP, employee assistance program, where you can tap into uh, free of charge and confidential uh, the services of licensed behavioral health professionals. So you could talk to a clinician one, two, maybe three times free of charge, no one knows. And it really helps you to, to reestablish your, 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 your balance, whether it's work-life balance or emotional balance. It can also help you decide if you need a more permanent arrangement or a higher level of assistance. And what we found during the pandemic is that a lot of per diems have been tapping into the EAP as well. Uh, and it's a, it, it's a wonderful benefit of being per diem in an organization. You may feel like a freelancer, but you're really an employee. And so there are some benefits that are, that are associated with that that can help you uh, survive and thrive throughout a pandemic. The other thing we've been doing is making time to round, whether it's in person, wherever we have interpreters on campus, or one-to-one -one video chats with folks who are home to check in on them, to talk to them individually about issues that they're experiencing. Because again, in, in, in March, we thought we'd be home for a few weeks, and it's eight months later. And while we have returned a number of interpreters to campus over the summer and fall months, we still have 32 people at home, and we still need to take care of them. And we need to foster that feeling of togetherness and mission and purpose and, and vision. So how can you apply this to your own situation? Maybe you are leading an interpreter program or you're advising an institution that has one. I believe it's really important to invest in a multimodality staff interpreter model and to be sure that every one of your staff um, is comfortable working across modalities, stretching their skill set. I think of the modalities as vehicles. Uh, and what matters most in road safety is the quality of the driver and whether or not they've been trained to drive the vehicle that they're driving. And so that's something to look at now if you haven't already. Uh, the importance of debriefing regularly and re-recruiting your team, uh, not taking anyone's uh, well-being for granted, uh, but checking in with them continually. How are they doing and do they still feel connected uh, to the organization? Uh, to the work, to the patients? And do they have suggestions on how to make it better? Uh, the interpreters, for example, have had a lot of suggestions on how to make telehealth better, uh, how to adapt that portal uh, in new and innovative ways to make it easier to navigate. Um, really, the people on the front lines know what challenges patients are having because they're, they're walking them through those challenges every day. This is also a great time if you're running an interpreter program to reimagine the in-house call center. If you didn't have one before, if all of your interpreters were sitting on top of each other, when they come back, if they have come back, they need to come back in a way that's safe, 
Um, so looking at the physical space, is there enough space for physical distancing? Is there visual privacy? Is there sound quality? Do we have good ventilation? Uh, it may be better to have small teams in multiple locations than to have everyone together, uh, especially if they don't have their own enclosed spaces, like an enclosed four-sided cubicle, for example. Um, now is the time and not later to integrate language access into your telehealth platform and to really advocate for this. And you might be able to, to leverage other other departments within your organization, for example, diversity and inclusion, uh, or health equity, uh, or physician champions, uh, to make sure that language access is part of the conversation in telehealth, uh, and that you know you're not just purchasing a prepackaged product that was made for English speakers, but you're you're customizing what you have to the needs of your organization. And you're probably not 43% LEP, but I know that you have sizable groups that need to navigate their online um, platforms, uh, and, and and we need to let them have that voice, whether it's you know through through patient advisory, through family advisory. Uh, through interpreters participating in interdisciplinary work groups, the voice of language access has to be at the telehealth conversation. And so that's an opportunity to work with patients in a way that we haven't before, uh, to produce something better, to co-produce it with them. Uh, our CEO likes to say that this is a great time, the pandemic, to assess what we have and whether it's good for us and to let go of things that no longer serve us well and to build something better in concert with our patients and our staff. And so that's something you really wanna think about as an institution. As an individual, uh, maybe you are a staff interpreter that has struggled through the pandemic. Maybe you are freelance, maybe you've lost work, maybe you're trying to figure out how to be more competitive or you're thinking about interpreting in the future. Uh, you know, how do I break into this field now? Um, I, I would say make it your goal to become proficient and also develop a comfort level with different modalities of interpretation. So if you do like in-person interpreting, the reality of now and of the near future is that you're gonna to have to do it under a mask and under a face shield. So what does that feel like? And it might be a good idea to practice with it at home. Um, how do you project without losing your voice? Uh, how do you engage uh, in a way that feels safe? What do you do if your shield fogs up continually? What's a safe way to manage that while in person? Uh, these are things to plan for, to practice before you're out there on the floors and to talk to other colleagues about, you know, what are their best practices uh, so that you have that level of comfort. Um, interpreting by phone, interpreting by video, interpreting on Zoom or some other telehealth platform. How does that feel? How are you stretching your skill set in a way that feels a little bit of initial discomfort is, is, is okay. Uh, are you adding new skills during the pandemic? Is it a time of learning for you? It could be. There are some wonderful courses that you can take online uh, that can help you interpret remotely. And they can also teach you new skills like remote simultaneous. We don't do a lot of simultaneous interpreting in healthcare, at least we didn't pre-pandemic. Uh, but when we think about moving forward, how will we do community events? How will we do group sessions? How will we do patient education? It's probably not going to be in person. It's probably not going to be with that Williams sound headset and microphone. It's probably going to be on a platform like Zoom uh, or another platform, maybe some that's built for remote simultaneous interpreting. So have you used one? Uh, have you tried it out? Have you been observed? Um, this is a great time for learning and for building skills that will last not, not just throughout, but beyond the pandemic. Uh, this is a great time in an organization to advocate for better working conditions, to partner with management and occupational health in designing a better call center or a better interpreter office. And don't forget to take care of yourself. Self-care is important. And self-care means different things to different people. Um, but it's really important to take care of your spirituality, uh, take care of your emotional health, take care of your physical health. It's all connected. Uh, so whatever you do that brings you comfort, that brings you health, that brings you a feeling of well-being, do it more during the pandemic to the extent that you can, because we need more self-care now. We are all under unprecedented strain. Make use of all of the institutional supports, whether that's the EAP or 
or um, tuition reimbursement, find out what you can get from your institution now and use it. Uh, and then leverage your association memberships. Uh, every association brings opportunities for free learning like this uh, and, and follow some of the thought leaders in interpreting on Facebook or, or, or LinkedIn. Uh, tap into what they have to offer because we need it now. We also might have more time for it right now. Uh, um, and then finally, you know, if you're thinking about how to remain competitive, this is a really um, good time to, to pursue interpreter certification. Uh, and there are two certifying bodies for medical slash healthcare interpreters in the United States. Research them, look into them, think about national certification, start taking the steps for it. Uh, because should you find yourself newly in the market, let's say the, your hospital system does have to downsize, you do get furloughed or you, you've lost some clients, uh, or you've lost your, your, your modality, you need, to, you need to expand or get back out there, um, you will find, no matter how many years you've been in the field, that interpreters with certification have an advantage. Uh, and so get that advantage for yourself and leverage it in your job search and in your next career steps. So those are some of my thoughts. Lessons learned at CHA, application to institutions and interpreters, and I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. Um, but before we turn it over to q and I do wanna say there will probably be a second wave. We are seeing the number of cases increase right now, um, depending on what happens over the holidays uh, and how folks decide to socialize and interact and, and get out of their homes. That second wave could happen between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It could happen between Christmas and New Year's. It could happen in February. Uh, so. We're waiting, we're watching, we're trying to be careful. But one thing we know for sure is that language access will continue to be vital. Interpreters will continue to be essential. And not just in that trite sense of essential workers, we are essential uh, to patient provider communication. And patients and providers are communicating now more than ever before. And the stakes are higher. So like I say to, to our team, and here are some of our faces, um, this is a pre-COVID event where folks were talking about what care to the people means to them uh, and what they do as interpreters. We're in this together and we're gonna survive this together and we're gonna thrive together. And I say that to you too, because I believe this is true and that it can be replicated everywhere. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I open this up to your questions and comments.